Good morning to you all. I'd like to welcome you to Stanford Church. I'm not standing at the door, door, door like Nita does, but actually I thought of doing it. But anyway, I copied that tradition and took it with me to the churches I preached at in the last couple of years. Well, no, it wouldn't be a couple of years. Anyway, last year. And people thought it was great, so I, I gave her the credit. <laughs> Carl's worship is uh, taken from Isaiah 11. I shoot. I think I do better without this, right? Yeah. And, uh, a shoot shall come from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. He shall delight, shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see, nor decide by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. The wolf shall live with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kin, and the calf and the lion and the fat linen together, and the little child shall lead them. They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Opening hymn 161, what child is this? Injustice and poverty, racial prejudice, 
and discrimination against the minorities of all kinds. Help us to be fair and merciful to any who might hurt us or attack us or even betray us. Forgive us where we have refused to include others in the warmth of our love. May we recognize the hope that Jesus brought to earth and trust in the assurance that our sins are forgiven, our redemption is accomplished. May we hear you calling us to live at peace with one another, with respect and dignity and equality. Help us to receive and respond to your invitation to be part of the plan to transform the world, to make it a little more like the kingdom of heaven. And where we fall short of your gracious invites and the hope that Jesus brings, forgive us, we ask, bless our efforts, sometimes meager, and grant us always the assurance of your pardon, love, and hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Assurance of pardon in the New Testament is good news for us all. Every night or every morning, God wipes clean the slate of our lives. And whatever we did that wasn't right the day before, it's wiped clean. And we can go forth freshly forgiven, freshly healed, ready to tackle the world in its name. First reading now is Isaiah 9, 2 to 7. This is a famous reading that we, I think as children, we learned it almost off by heart. Certainly with all the Christmas pageants, <laughs> you just don't know it. And of course we know it in the original uh, version of the Bible, which is the King James, right? The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light, and those who lived in the land of deep darkness, on them has the light shined. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you, as with joy at harvest time, when people exult when dividing the plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulder, the rod of the oppressor you have broken, just like in the days of Midian. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. All right. So this is a children's story, right? You're all young at heart? Yeah. I, have to, I have to laugh when I say that. All right. In that lesson, there are these four descriptive phrases, which the children have to memorize. Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Wonderful Counselor, Prince of Peace. And I always wonder, what is that all about? How are kids supposed to understand that? Anyway. So, wonderful counselor. So, I dug out this is the first Bible that was given um, Sunday school, right? By the, the uh, Sunday school of Knox Presbyterian Church, Whitewood, Saskatchewan. Dad was the minister, and so he signed it. 1958. The early, earliest version of a wonderful counselor. The Bible has been wonderful counselor for people for a long time to advise, to guide, uh, to instruct. And inform. Wonderful counselor. I think I think of the Bible. And in this one is sort of precious because it's from well, sort of like when I first began. Now waiting God, <clears throat> I didn't bring my hockey stick right today. <laughs> but you know, well I had to bring a helmet. Mighty God. The helmet. The helmet protects the head. Now this is the same as mighty God. But it helps me to think of mighty God because and I got this on, and there's very little continuing damage up top, right? It doesn't protect the rest, but I have the rest at home. Everlasting Father. Well, usually when you use a candlestick as a prop, you put a candle in it and put a light in it. Jesus, the light of the world, right? But 
but this is supposed to be an everlasting father. So I went through our house today to find, yesterday, the oldest thing that we have. Well, other than the Bible, but that's not an original that old. Well, this is my grandmother's candlestick, which she uh, and her husband obtained in about 1905 at an auction sale. So this is the oldest thing that we have. The everlasting father. This is not everlasting, but it's the oldest thing we have to help me remember. The everlasting father that just quit, the father that has no beginning, the father that has no end. And, of course, the last one, the Prince of Peace. This was in my, our house growing up. My dad made this, I don't know, in, in the 1940s, I guess. And it was always in the house. And when we were parting the goods, shall we say, I said, I wanted the cross because it brought back all those memories. And it also is a sign of the work of my dad and his respect for Calvary and the resurrection, of course. But this reminds me of the Prince of Peace, and the price paid to be a Prince of Peace was the cross. Of course, these four descriptive phrases are all talking about the Christ child. Unto us a son is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And then you have the four descriptive phrases. So I asked our daughter to go to the house and bring me the closest thing what we have with the baby Jesus. Well, our grandchildren, our grandchildren are nine years old now, so this is the best I could do. Anyway, it's about the birth of the baby, the Son of God. And that, the baby um, who grows up, brings all those things together. They're really all about the baby who becomes the Messiah. Thus ended the children's story.
sung and heard this day. We need help to magnify the story, to understand the story, and put the message in our hands to take the same story to the world. In Jesus' name. Well, how do you begin about the angels? How do you begin about the shepherds? When you've told this story, I factored, I calculated 40 times. And that's all, right? It's much the same as the, probably the first sermon I ever gave. But this year with that COVID and so on, um, there's been a lot less emphasis on church and faith. And people are all sort of on their own even though this church and others have made great efforts to uh, virtual service and, you know, we've all done their very best we can. But I found myself um, more in touch with the world and the message that it has, which isn't anything to do with Christmas at all. And so, uh, as usual, the um, radio stations saw me plug into Christmas music, oh, for about two weeks, maybe three weeks, and on Christmas, Day at about 8 o'clock at night, they shut it down. And right now, there isn't anything about Christmas at all. It's about New Year's and the, the coming down of the ball and uh, Anderson and Hoover and uh, in Niagara Falls and, uh, uh, and the World Juniors. Didn't the Canadian? That wasn't that. You can't skunk the Germans. It's not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> so, we've been moving away from the story. And so I thought today, look, Try and, and, and get the people back in touch with really what it's, what it's all about. What has happened in, in Bethlehem and what are the implications for the shepherds and the implications for us. So, that's where I'd like to go. If you begin, what's the background? You know, what, what could the shepherds have been thinking before this happened? Apart from the fact that it was cold and they had to stay up all night and watch over the blessed sheep, right? Because if any of them got loose or killed or so on, guess what? They, they'd be in big trouble. But they might have been thinking about the promises of God, and wouldn't it be nice if they ever came to pass? And so you think of, um, to start with uh, Isaiah 7, uh, a young woman shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Wouldn't it be nice to have an Emmanuel in our midst anytime soon. And then they could have been thinking of the uh, Isaiah 9, which we did for, for the children, those four descriptive phrases. Um, the Exodus was nice, but it's a long time ago. What we need is the mighty God right now to straighten out the world, especially to lift the, the bondage of the Roman oppressor from off our shoulders, just like on the days of Midian, which the lesson says. A mighty God, an everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Wow, Prince of Peace, that would be marvelous. If anyone could pull it off. And also the passage from Isaiah 11, which I did for the call to worship, and the wolf shall lie down with the lamb. Oh, it's hard enough having a dog and a cat in the same house. How can the wolf lie down with the lamb? Or as Priyar Trudeau said, when the, when the elephant lies down with the, the mouse, guess who doesn't sleep? Huh. Yeah. But that's the promise, that they shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, the wolf and the, the uh, lamb, the lion and the kid, uh, can all live safely. What kind of a world? Wouldn't that make a marvelous world if we could have, uh, not talking about the animals, but if we could all get along a lot better but the pro there are so many problems and divisions in our world, and that's why we continue to have trouble wherever you have two conflicting uh, religions, philosophies, ideas, or even more than two, as you know. But wouldn't it be nice if all these things ever happened? Well, up in heaven, <coughs> there's a bit of a debate going on. The time has come, God said, for the Messiah. We're going to send Jesus down, he's going to be born as a baby, and he's going to be born in Bethlehem. I've got it all set up. I've tuned, tuned in Caesar Augustus to help us with the timing. And uh, what we need now is um, the message to be proclaimed. We need messengers down there. Oh, so the Council of Heaven said, call in the CBC. You know, Andrew Marie Girardi and Andrew Chang. And uh, uh, 
those guys are doing a great job. But then someone said, the CDC doesn't exist yet, and neither does CNN. And what are we going to do? So someone said, send in the shepherds. Shepherds? You've got to be kidding. They're the lowliest bunch on the totem pole, the very bottom end where, um, you know, would you want your daughter to marry a shepherd? And the answer came back, no, 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 think about it carefully now. The, the shepherds show compassion for the weak and for the lost. And that's what I want to do, to show that kind of love, especially for the marginalized people of the world. And they're outdoors communing with me and looking at the stars, and they're thinking religious thoughts, which is not very frequent when people are outside. Silent reflection. It's time to mull it all over. And these are humble people and the responsible people. So, uh, the vote from God is shepherds, and the council was, uh, the council didn't have a veto over God. And so the shepherds um, are instructed in the field by the angels. The first thing the angels say to them, fear not. Well, every pageant I've ever run, the kids are scared to death. And that's, that's nice, it's a good way to begin. You have to unfrighten the children because these angels are, you know, the dazzling array and they usually have a bright light of some kind. Fear not. God can come amongst us now and we don't have to fear. And so that now that the angels, they slow, the shepherds slowly lift their faces to court the angels and the angels are able to clue them in. Unto you we good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. And unto you is born this day, in the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And there shall be a sign unto you. You will find the baby, well, a little bit like that, right? Wrapped in a towel, swaddling clothes actually, and lying in a manger. And this child that is born is Christ the Lord. Now this is very very uh, uh, heavy duty stuff. Christ the Lord and the promises of Christ the Lord in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. One who makes peace between God and man. One who forgives the sins of the world. And one who ushers in the promise of heaven, everlasting life. So this is the promise that the angels give to the shepherds. And the shepherds are, uh, well, that's to say they're, they're surprised, they're shocked, can't find all the right words, um, but they say, look, this is just down the road, this is Bethlehem. Um, let's go and see this. Let's go and see if this is crap. Let's go and see with our very own eyes. And so, they I never understood this part, they abandoned the sheep. Now that's something you're not supposed to do. <clears throat> but they might have left, left a couple of shepherds behind. The, sleep were, the sheep were all asleep. I mean, that's so nice to imagine. And uh, so they go to Bethlehem, and uh, I've always enjoyed this scene. Joseph, best jo Joseph I ever had. He, this is supposed to be like a cave setting or a manger setting, and he parts the gloom, he parts the gloom, and he looks out the three scruffs, or a bunch of scruffily dressed shepherds. Now what is going on? And they say, we were visited by angels, and Joseph thinks, Strange world out there. God is doing strange things, majestic and powerful things. I am struggling to keep up with it. And He has sent us to visit the Savior of the world, Christ's child. So Joseph always lets them in and they're very quiet. The shepherds are very quiet. And I think one of them was always instructed to bring a blanket, which wasn't like the gifts of the wise men. But anyway, that's what we always had. And uh, they admire see and behold and then they head out and according to Luke they went out praising and glorifying God and that's that's the way that's the, I think that's a majestic part of the story and when they got home they told everybody now about a few years ago we had the Marcionite Bishop um, of Bethlehem visiting Canada visiting our church and he told us you know we still have shepherds in the fields, and they are descendants of shepherds in this story. This is our story. We are the shepherds. 
it still, and that's our story, and we still regard it as such. And we can tell you about it. We can tell you what it was like on that, feet, on that night. We can tell you the joy of the shepherds because we share in that joy with them. So the message goes out. And so I find when you look, we've got four Gospels that in various ways reflect this story and the joy. It's Luke, of course, who um, tells us the, the birth narrative. The way it worked was, first of all, people concentrated on the resurrection. Jesus Christ, crucified and risen. That's what our story, if you were just in a village and the missionary came to tell you what the story was all about, which of course my parents did that in India, I used to go along for the ride, and they would be telling this story to mystified villagers, mostly women, uh, over a cup of coffee, which we, are, we would always bring. And uh, that's how it began. The story of Jesus is resurrection and cross and resurrection. But then it was realized, you know, the story really goes back to baptism. Jesus is the Son of God, not just on the cross and at the resurrection, he's the Son of God at his baptism. And so you have uh, um, Mark's Gospel begins the story, of course he's been copying Matthew, right? Uh, Matthew's been copying him. The, the original story is Mark, and it begins with the baptism of Jesus. And so that was understood. So then what happened after that was, Luke was talking about Pentecost, and he said what God did in creation is the same, this is version number two, what he does at Pentecost is, is starting all over again. His you know, spirit was moving over the face of the waters of creation. The spirit is moving in Pentecost. So the idea that God and Jesus goes back to creation. Well, then John's Gospel does nothing to, uh, as Mark doesn't have a birth narrative at all, and he's interested in showing that Jesus goes back cross, resurrection, baptism, birth creation, the beginning of time. The Word was with God, the Word was God. Whenever you're talking about Jesus, you're talking about someone who always existed, part of God, with God, and he was God. And that's the, that's the story of the four Gospels given to you at, um, quickly, I suppose. Simeon, remember, the old man, I think, I don't think now, well, I'm just about as old as Simeon, so. <clears throat> Simeon says, Mine eyes have seen the salvation of God. God made visible. John said, God made flesh. And that's what it's all about. God becoming part of our world to show us who he is. And that message of Jesus and God the Father and the Holy Spirit then goes out into all the world. And we have been instructed to teach and to baptize, not just to make God, to make followers, of course, and teach them to observe all that I've commanded you, even on to the end of the world. Well, it's a nice story. It's about a long time ago. The thing is, it's now our story. And like the Marcionite shepherds, now the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's in our hands. And what are we going to do? That's a good question, right? And Mark's Gospel tells us in a kind of way what we're going to do. The, the way Mark's Gospel ends, if you remember, and maybe it's told at Easter, um, they go to the cross, the women go to the tomb, and they uh, find an angel who tells them Jesus has gone on ahead, he's going to meet you all in Galilee, and, uh, and that's it. They leave. They run away, they're scared, they tell nobody. They tell nobody what happened. And, well, that's exactly the opposite of what I'm asking you to do. The question is, of course, why did Mark write it like that? And the answer is, well, because by that time people understood the resurrection. They heard, they'd heard about it, they believed in it. And so when they see this ending, they're going to say, no, 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 Mark, that's, that's not the way it ends. It's supposed to end with us taking the story out, not sitting on it, and suppressing it. And 
And so you're supposed to catch on that Martin knew what he was doing and it's really giving you a reverse message. And so that thing and the story and the Savior and the Gospel are in your hands, in my hands. And the question is, well, what are we going to do with it? We can't sit on it like the ending of Mark's Gospel, which is the opposite of what happened. We have to take it out and proclaim it, especially though to show it. Someone said, words are helpful, um, practice is better. Let us pray. Lord, just help us in this work of proclaiming the gospel, the story, to tell to the nations. We are part of the story now, and it's important that we do our role in our time to make sure that the Savior is known and worshipped and to help in the growth and work and witness of the church in his name. So we pray. Amen. Now it's time for the offering. I think what you're going to do is the offertory. I think you're going to play, Jackie. Yeah. yeah. <laughs>
God the Heavenly Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with you this day and forevermore. Thank you.